David is a former bobsledder. He's a founding member of the Israeli bobsled team, and he is uh, currently the president of the Israeli Bobsled Skeleton Federation, and he's also president of the JNF of Winnipeg and Manitoba, right? Yeah. And David is with us live all the way from Winnipeg tonight, so thanks. Thanks for helping us put this together, and thanks for agreeing to host tonight. David, it's all yours. Thanks so much, Shane. So thank you for having us and, to, and also to Tamar for organizing this. Uh, Tamar is one of our board members and is our marketing director and she's been volunteering her time with us since before 2012. So she's a lifer, uh, as am I. Um, I'm just gonna do uh, a couple quick, uh, have a couple quick remarks, but I'd like to say that there's the greatest thrill for any athlete is to represent their country, um, whatever country it happens to be. Um, and as, as, as a kid growing up as an athlete, you might hope one day to represent your country. Um, in the case of a Canadian like myself or an American like Jared, they may not have thought 20 years ago, I didn't think when I was a kid growing up that I might represent Israel. I thought if I was gonna be uh, an international athlete, I'd probably rep be representing Canada. But regardless, there's no greater thrill. There's something special though about representing Israel and I don't think I have to um, uh, convince anyone of that that's on this call. Whether you're on the Maccabi USA team uh, or, sorry. Um, Sorry. Sorry. Oi, where are we here? There you are. I'm sorry. Someone didn't realize I'm busy. Um, can you all hear me still? Okay. Yeah. Um, what, what I was saying is it, it's, it's, there's no greater thrill um, representing your country uh, and that there's something special about representing Israel. Um, uh, and wearing the Star of David, um, what I've said before is we're proud to be Jewish, we're proud to be Israeli, um, and we're proud to wear the Star of David because we want to wear the Star of David, not because someone is making us wear the Star of David as they did many years ago. So um, it's, it's a juxtaposition for us as athletes and the representatives of, of Israel to do something we feel is very special. Um, our federation began in 2002 uh, with a, uh, a bobsled team that grew into bobsled and skeleton, uh, which grew uh, after 16 years of competing and trying and trying. Uh, in 2018, we qualified our first Olympian. Um, I don't know if he's online, but his name is AJ Edelman uh, in skeleton, um, and that helped grow our program a little bit um, and, and, and provide some uh, exposure to the Israeli program and to Israelis to the program. Um, and the year after the Olympics, we started to get a couple calls of interest from other athletes and sort of enter, enter Jared and other athletes as well. Um, but we met Jared and it was a no brainer for us. He comes with uh, an incredible athletic background um, as a sprinter. Um, and that's been one of the things, and I think all our, uh, our current and, and former uh, skeleton athletes would say has been something that was a challenge for us. Um, we weren't necessarily born sprinters and we had to work at it. Jared is a born sprinter and he comes by it naturally and he's had some amazing successes uh, even in just his first year um, in terms of push times and start times and all kinds of things that he may get into. Um, I've already gone over my 90 seconds, so uh, it's, I just want to introduce Jared, who, is, who has a phenomenal story. I'm pumped that his family's here, and, uh, and the rest of you as well. And um, uh, the last thing I'll say before I, I hand it over is these sports are often sports that people come to after their original athletic career. Most bobsledders you see, most skeleton athletes you see, they didn't grow up in clubs uh, doing these sports. They were football players. They were track and field athletes. So anyone that's out there who had an athletic background, has an athletic background, and is interested in finding more about how to potentially become a bobsleigh athlete or a skeleton athlete and to compete for Israel and to compete for us, we would certainly welcome 
any inquiries. So with that, I'll hand it over to uh, I'll, I'll take over from here, David. Thank thanks, you. Thanks, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> I got you. I'm uh, at all. Uh, thanks, David. Thanks, uh, Shane, for hosting this event. And thanks, everyone, for coming, of course. I'm Jerry Firestone, uh, coming from you from Hollywood, Florida, where I grew up. I went to Jewish day school growing up um, and then went to Tulane University, uh, where I graduated in 2012 and was a member of the track team for all four years as a sprinter. Uh, after Tulane, I went to law school at Cardozo in New York City, so I'm a lawyer by trade now, but my main commitment is being an athlete, um, part of the uh, Israel skeleton team. So when I tell people that I'm a lawyer, but really I do skeleton, I always get three questions. What is skeleton? How do you get into it? And then how did a guy from Hollywood, Florida end up doing this crazy winter sport for Israel of all places? So I'll start with the first question, which is what is skeleton? And Probably the best way to explain it is with a video. Uh, so that's what skeleton is. The next question is, how did I get into skeleton? So as I mentioned, I ran the 100 meters in high school here in Fort Lauderdale, Pinecrest School. Uh, went to college, ran at Tulane University, and then I went to law school. So briefly, my athletic career was on hold. Uh, I was really deep into my studies. And then two months into my first semester of law school, I had a TIA, which is a mini stroke. Just woke up one morning. Couldn't feel the right side of my body. I thought I just slept on it wrong. Um, go to brush my teeth. I can't lift the toothbrush on my left hand now. Uh, call my dad. He's on speed dial. Now I can't even get the words out to him. I'm trying to tell him what's going on. Luckily, he's a physician. He's a gynecologist, but he was still able to pick up on what was going on and uh, told me to, since my legs were still working, to get over to the emergency room, which I did. And there was a two-month period after that where uh, doctors, I was seeing all sorts of neurologists, cardiologists, trying to figure out what happened and what the consequences would be. And uh, luckily, after two months, I was cleared to resume activity, but there was definitely a period of time where things didn't look good and I didn't know, uh, much less competing at a high level again, I didn't think I'd even be able to just do simple things like lift weights or go for runs, anything like that again. So at that time, I decided I'm not taking my ability to be athletic and play sports at any level for granted, I'm gonna start running track again. So I started doing that. And then uh, that summer, my cousin is in this chat. Uh, we were talking about the 2014 Winter Olympics and uh, he's like, oh, there's a sports skeleton. And if you look up the guys, a lot of them, they start pretty late. Uh, they have track backgrounds in Team USA. They recruit people with track backgrounds uh, and try to get them into their program. So I go on the website. I end up at a combine in Poughkeepsie, New York, running around, lifting weights for uh, some sliding coaches, and they invite me back up to Lake Placid to learn how to slide. So now the question is, I go and slide for USA, how do I end up sliding for Israel? So comp uh, basically competing for Israel was something I always wanted to do uh, from a young age. When I went to Jewish day school, um, really learned a lot about Israel and why it's so important. But the March of the Living, um, which I attended in 2008 during my senior year, uh, really made me realize how important and special Israel is and how if it existed uh, then, all the tragedy could have been prevented. And on top of that, now going to, going to college, uh, just realizing once I got out of the kind of Jewish day school bubble here, how many unfair misconceptions there are about Israel. And it made me want to create a platform of some sort where I could educate people and talk to young people. And unfortunately, not everybody has a chance to go to Jewish day school. Uh, even my Jewish friends in college and after that, they just really didn't know anything. They didn't get it. And, uh, and it, it, wasn't, it, was, it wasn't their fault. It just, it felt, it seemed like they just didn't have the proper background and the proper resources growing up and people that were willing to talk to them about it. And, and uh, you know, not everybody has the opportunity to go on a trip like March of the Living, but what we can do is tell them what we saw and what we experienced and what we know about it. So that's really what motivates me. Um, obviously you saw some of those big hits I took and lots of bruises. It's very cold. I had to give up a lot of things. Um, but when it comes back at the end of the day, that's what I think about. And that's what motivates me through that. So now another event that really stuck with me growing up was the Munich massacre at the 1972 Olympics. 
um, 11 Israeli athletes and coaches were taken hostage and killed in Germany. Um, and so when I kind of combined those two, and I realized that the best way to create this opportunity for me personally, to t be able to talk about the Holocaust and talk about the experience, the Jewish experience and what Israel means to us, uh, it kind of, I put the two together and realized that for me, sport was the best opportunity to do that. So at first, I wasn't super serious about skeleton initially. I went to the tryout, kind of thought it'd be cool. Really, I was just trying to test where I was as a track athlete at the time because I really wanted to go on and represent Israel in the 100 meters in track and field. Um, but I, I went anyways. I made a deal with my parents. If I pass the bar, I'll go try out sliding. And then, so I did that. And while I was there, um, I found out Israel had a skeleton and bobsled team. And AJ Edelman, who David mentioned, ended up going to the Olympics in 2018. And for me, that was what I wanted to do. That was my inspiration. So I uh, talked to AJ, some other people in the Israel program, and they advised me, stick in the U.S. program, uh, get some knowledge under your belt, get some of the good coaching they offer, just soak it all up. And then when you're ready, come over to our side. So um, after three years in the U.S. program last summer, I decided it was time. And I made Aliyah. And last season was pretty much, obviously my goal was to make the Olympics in 2022, but the experiences already have been incredible. Um, just the motivation when, you, when you're going out and I know I'm going to be out there and I'm going to be sliding with the Magen David on my helmet and, you know, the impression that's going to make on people, what they're going to think and how I'm representing when I'm out there, I'm representing not just Israel, but all Jews. And it just made it so much easier to do all the work I need to do to be great at skeleton or try to be great at skeleton. And I just made a huge leap um, from going from my last year with USA to Israel. I ended up 76 in the world, which was the second highest uh, rated rookie um, in terms of international sliders on tour. And more importantly than that, even I was able to create that platform to educate people that I was seeking. Um, for example, I got to go to Korea and I was there and pretty much nobody there had ever met a Jew. And so I got to be the first impression for a lot of those people and get to explain to them what being, being a Jew is really and what Israel is and all the connection between the two. Uh, in Germany, I had one day off and I went to Munich and I visited, I visited where the uh, Munich massacre took place in the Olympic Village. Here's some photos. And then I followed that by going to Dachau and visit the camps there. And I went wearing my Israeli jacket. And that's another thing. Uh, we're advised not to wear our Israeli paraphernalia when we're out, especially in Europe. But that day I was just like, had to wear it. And I went and I visited these places and I went to Dachau and people were asking me questions on the tour. You know, it was one of those big tour groups and nobody else was Jewish. And just to be able to be that representative and be that person that people look to for information and to learn more and to understand it was just incredible. And going back to the tracks, this is in Koenigsee, just a practice run. You can see how many people are up there just watching. And I'll go and, you know, in my training, sometimes I wear my USA uniform because I don't want to mess up my Israel one. But then I step up to the line, I put the helmet on, and I could, even though I'm focused on what I'm doing, I could just sense that reaction, like the, the murmur from the crowd. And then when I come up, people want to talk to me and they they are touching my equipment and like asking all these questions, which they don't do to the other athletes. And I, you know, the other athletes wouldn't even stand for it. They would yell at them. Like my sled's $8,000 don't touch it, but it's just part of my responsibility. I know I need to go and talk to them and, you know, be that, that uh, face for Israel, especially for a lot of them. I know they don't know anything about Jewish people or Israel personally. Um, and then really the highlight of the year though, was uh, going to Koenigsee and, AJ established a tradition, I think, in 2015 or 16, where we make sure that one athlete from the team is there to light Hanukkah candles. The significance being that Hitler's eagle nest is like three or four kilometers from the track. Um, so here's a picture at the bottom of Lake Koenigsee. And then just on, basically on the other side of the lake is where the track is. And this year I got to be, I got to be the representative for Israel. And it was probably even though I was completely alone in a really questionable uh, hostel, uh, just <laughs> being able to light the candles every night and, you know, make our presence known there and know I was doing that, uh, I really did not feel alone. So that was my experience. And now I'm going to open it up to questions and answers. 
Jared, <clears throat> thanks for sharing. I wonder, can you tell us a little bit about your very first run? What was that like physically, emotionally? Yeah, the, good question. I have a photo. Let me pull it up. So, <laughs> so basically, this is me on my first run. Um, you get pushed off. You don't go from the top, luckily. I can't describe how nervous <laughs> I was the entire day. Uh, but the coach is very comforting and just takes your legs and pushes you. And from, from that height, or you're only going about 40 miles an hour, but I could definitely tell you the first time I hit a wall, it was pretty shocking. It was not what I was expecting. It's not smooth like a, high, a hockey rink. It's, uh, they're a little rough around the edges, and uh, my arms were black for about three weeks after that. Can you just show that photo again? I think it was a little bit off center on the screen. Oh, yeah, I think the whole thing. How's that? There you go. Yeah. So that's that's my first slide in Lake Placid, going from about halfway down the track. And I'll add, if anybody ever wants to try it themselves, uh, you could come up to Lake Placid, just uh, coordinate with me when I'm there. And uh, they allow you to take bobsled runs and skeleton runs from there. I actually, my mom's going to kill me, but since a lot of her friends are in here, I do a video of her trying it really quickly. That's, that's what it looks like. <laughs> you don't know what you're doing. That was your mom on the skeleton track? Yeah, that was my mom doing skeleton after uh, the, my whole family came up to one of my races, like Placid, and they, they gave it Way a shot. Way to go, mom. That's amazing. <laughs> uh, we know that your goal is to qualify for the Winter Olympics in Beijing. Can you tell us a little bit about the process of what's involved to get there? Yeah, so uh, they just changed the rules. So now instead of 30, 25 men will qualify and 25 women will qualify. Um, the way it works is kind of this complicated quota system, but they want, you know, solid representation from all countries, not just stacked with Germans and Austrians and Canadians, et cetera. So a couple of countries will get three, a handful of countries will get two representatives, and then I think seven countries will get one representative and you know we're hoping to get since we have two men's skeleton athletes that's what we're aiming for on the men's side and the women's side we're hoping our female athlete gets into one of the uh the single sled spots um and the way you qualify is there's eight races before the olympics so this would be basically 13 months from now when those would start and there's different circuits and you get depending on the difficulty of the circuit you'll get more points based on your finish and at the end they take the ranking sheet and that's where they, they pick everyone out from. So hoping to be in one of those top 25 uh, quota spots. So where geographically do you have to travel to uh, do those qualif qualifiers? Right, so my home track is Lake Placid and Park City, I would say is my backup. Those are two in the US. Uh, Whistler is the other North American track, which I spent some time on. Uh, and then the track in Germany where we saw the video I've been to a track in Austria and Korea as well, and there's many more I haven't been to yet, but those tracks are the ones I'm focusing on, and we'll try to take the races on. And are there specific events? Specific events, meaning? Uh, like uh, World Championships, yes. um, World Cup, those, those kinds of things. Right, so that race, the one I showed was from World Cup. There's uh, a North American and European Cup circuit, which are the lowest, and the Intercontinental, which has two races, on in the North America continent to in Europe or Asia and then the World Cup is the highest circuit so um world champs was supposed to be in Lake Placid this year and that was one of the uh I guess one of the casualties of corona was that world champs got moved from Lake Placid to Germany uh but other than that the season with some modifications is uh going on as a as a full season this year it, it's kind of hard to uh not mention the COVID pandemic how has that complicated your quest yeah it makes traveling and planning hard uh with the north american tracks they're still figuring things out in terms of non-usa team usa sliders coming on so it's a little difficult um as of now i'm planning to go to europe to start the season uh, they have luckily they have some good uh sport professional sportsmen exemptions that, that help you get in the countries so um yeah, mostly it's a travel and of course world champs being taken away was definitely a disappointment to not have it on my home track. But, um, you know, the main goal is next year, the Olympics. So it, it is what it is. So who is paying your way to get to all these places and, and 
give us an idea of like what does it cost for I don't know a, a suit a helmet a sled yeah definitely so um, a lot of people in this chat are paying the way not gonna <laughs> not gonna lie um, <laughs> it's very expensive last season cost me forty three thousand dollars the speed suit is six hundred fifty at two of those the spikes are three hundred fifty I think I have three of those now the sled is eight thousand um, the helmet another thousand with the uh with the paint job which i had to get obviously uh yeah it just really adds up airbnbs i have to have an suv the whole time to let my sled around uh and then coaching um last year for example in that video i was with the romanian coach i had to pay him to help me that week we don't have an official coach right now for skeleton so we kind of hop on with other countries and just you know pay a weekly rate depending on where i am i'll link up with different people but it it definitely adds up. So $43,000 last year, probably be about that this year and next year. So um, no, my supporters, my sponsors definitely make it all possible. Yeah, there was a question in the chat about um, what does Israel sponsor? I assume the question was about the Israeli Olympic Committee. Maybe you or David can comment a little bit about the relationship with the Israeli Olympic Committee. Yeah, so David would know better than me. I saw he wrote, uh, Israel provides very minimal funding, which is the same for most sports. Athletes yeah. do most of the heavy lifting. I think we got a small stipend this year. Um, David would know better than me, I think, with actually getting to the games and those costs associated with an athlete actually competing in the games. But as I'll answer the question just because I was in the middle of typing it. Um, so for the first number of years, many years, the Israel Olympic Committee – uh, did not even acknowledge us, uh, and so much so that once uh, one of our previous skeleton athletes was competing at the World Championships, and the the JTA contacted us, and they came out to Lake Placid, and they wanted to do an article, and we said, great, great a coverage, um, and uh, he reached out to the uh, National Olympic Committee of Israel, and they said, what, we don't have any skeleton athletes, what are you talking about? So uh, that was the nature of our relationship uh, not too long ago. Uh, and I was just about to write back in response to my, my, my answer is that they do provide minimal funding, which is a humongous step uh, in a positive direction for us. We have a really good relationship with our NOC after years of trying to get in the door. Uh, and certainly once we qualified for the Olympics a couple of years ago, that developed our relationship even further. Uh, and we're working um, to get more funding every year, but it's uh, the athletes haven't received any funding yet because we have to submit um, a few more expenses, but um, it's it's going to be it's less than a thousand dollars an athlete, probably less than that. Um, but again, um, it's something when we couldn't get in the door, and now they're actually providing anything to us. It's 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 great, and they also provide us access to Wingate, which is the world class uh, athletic facility campus uh, where the army trains. Uh, they do medical testing for us when needed. Uh, so they do provide those things for us when we're in Israel. So there is other things more than just uh, the funding. Hope that helps. Awesome. And would that change at all if you do qualify for Beijing? Uh, carded athletes, uh, athletes that get to the games will receive, uh, they call it a scholarship. So there'll be specific funding for the athlete. Um, and it might bump up our status as a federation a little bit, but more importantly, the athlete will get the money. So um, AJ, uh, when he came back from Korea, uh, received um, a nice a little bonus basically for having qualified for the Olympics. But it, it's not ongoing, um, depending on, again, depending on where your world rank is too. So um, the higher you are, the more you can advocate for some funding or some assistance. Terrific. Yeah. So it looks like Uri, who is a Maccabi USA alum and a former skeleton athlete, uh, asked, can you comment uh, how you feel when you get a really clean run? Much better when you have a really dirty run, that's for sure. Uh, yeah, there's nothing like it when you, it's not even the whole run. There's like these little parts of the track that all week you're just getting crushed on, like taking these big hits or falling off your sled, whatever's happening. And then you make that adjustment and you you get through and I'm in the middle of the run even sometimes and I'm like wow that feels amazing like I've never had this much speed and clean and not had a feel like my arms broken and then usually when you have that feeling the very next curve you forget what you're doing and you take an even bigger hit than you <laughs> would have had on the last one but when you do have the good run like in that race 
Um, I think I had a PR of like a second compared to training. Um, I just got to that track. Uh, you only get six runs at some of these races and going to Germany was my first time. So I had a week before and then I had the six runs and it was, it was a little bit of a struggle learning the track that quickly without a real coach. But um, yeah, on race day, just, it was unreal. Just having just that locked in focus and executing and, and making it down with uh, just so much better than I ever had and uh, seeing the time on the scoreboard, obviously. And just, uh, yeah, it's, it's hard to describe the exhilaration. I see uh, some of your, I guess they're your family members, your supporters have some Jewish jet swag. Where, where can we get some of that? <laughs> yeah, so that's on, I'll put the link in now. That's jewishjet.com. Uh, you'll see a tab at the top for uh, sponsorships and you'll see a team gear if you want any of <laughs> the hats and the shirts. And then I, I do some other cool stuff with uh, my sled and my website and uh, GoPro videos, uh, you know, a lot of, a lot of fun prizes on there. On your, on our Instagram feed today, uh, Jared was kind enough to take over and give us some insight into his life and to his routine. But could you maybe tell us a little bit more about your daily routine, about your diet, about your, you know, competition day routine, maybe some pump up music that you listen to? So I'm kind of weird with the music. Um, every other athlete's listening to music and I, I just don't, I don't do it on race days. I just like to, A, I'm paranoid that I'm, I always have this dream all the time that I'm like still in the start house and I miss my turn or I'm not warmed up yet. And I have to go out and like, I'm just like taking off my clothes and like going down with, with uh, like the wrong shoes on or whatever. Uh, so I, I usually actually don't listen to music because I like to hear the announcer and know what's going on. Um, as far as my daily routine, yeah, it's very different in the summer and in the winter. In the summer now, for example, today, um, I woke up, I had to be a lawyer for a little bit, and I went to the track, did my sprint workout. Uh, a lot of days I'll, I'll lift weights after two, but today I went and did some of my uh, mental coaching where I work on my decision processing with a, a coach here in, in Deerfield Beach. I'm always lying on my sled watching video and just thinking about skeleton, closing my eyes and imagining it. And obviously when I'm sliding, um, you know, I'm going to the track every day and just working out mostly, uh, cut out some of the mental work and cause I'm actually sliding and just focus on that and the coaching and watching video and learning from the mistakes and thinking what I'm going to do the next day. Uh, so it's, yeah, it's really all the time. You have to be on all the time. Uh, and my diet, my sister, Emmy, uh, has been helping me with it. She's, uh, in dietitian school at FIU and, uh, yeah, we're trying to get me into a lean, mean sliding machine. Um, Harrell, thanks for your question. He wants to know how you balance life as a, well, work as a lawyer and as a high level athlete. Yeah, so obviously my schedule, especially traveling so much in the winter, uh, no law firm is gonna hire me, which, you know, it kind of would be very difficult to fully commit to both anyways. So I do the law stuff on my own and my self practice. And I'll basically just plan that around skeleton as first. So I'll plan all that sort of around skeleton, around the workouts, around the training. Uh, but I, I sell real estate. I work as a lawyer because, again, with the $43,000, I got to put it together somehow. So um, just as much as uh, working out is part of my goal tree and part of what I need to do to make the Olympics, so is actually working because without that, again, it just can't happen. What is the scariest track that you have uh, competed on? Uh, so tr I train on Whistler, which is the fastest track. Uh, I hit 85 miles an hour there, and it's just it has the reputation as like uh, just the most dangerous track in the world where the 2010 uh, Vancouver Olympics were. Um, I have a video actually from there. So let me, I'll play that here. So this is actually probably the worst crash I've ever had. <laughs> It's going about probably 80 miles an hour there. Just really feels like getting punched in the, in the ribs on the side. But um, yeah, so competing, I mean, Lake Placid, just because I started there and, you know, I was there from day one. By the time I got to the other tracks, I had a little more experience. So I wasn't as concerned. Uh, but Whistler is definitely the, uh, the monster of all the tracks. Do you prefer a track that is faster or maybe a little bit more technically difficult? Um, I like 
I like to be doing things when I'm on the sled. Uh, there's, it's called like people are good at technical tracks and then gliders. Some people are just very easy to like melt into the sled and glide and basically just go through the track very smoothly. Um, yeah, I like to be doing things. So Lake Placid, you always have to be doing things. So I prefer Lake Placid, which is known as a very technical track. Uh, Eagles in Austria is a track where you just lie there and it was like very difficult for me to just accept just sitting there on the sled and not doing much and just letting the track uh, come to me instead of coming to it. Um, Marcy wanted to know more about the Romanian coach. Can you tell us a little bit more about him and how you got to know him and, and what he did for you? Definitely. So, um, and I have a picture of him also I'll share. So that's him in the coach's box after my very solid run at, at Koenigs at the World Cup. So Marius, um, AJ had worked with him during his Olympic year. So I got to Ger our Germany uh, pretty much with no support, no plan, uh, my first time there. Um, and then, uh, so I went to, the, I was going to the tracks alone and uh, luckily I was sending video back to AJ. I was pretty much being coached remotely. I would take the video from the track, send it to AJ, who was in grad school at the time last year. And he would give me feedback and it was like crazy schedule and uh, definitely difficult. Um, but then luckily I got in touch with Marius and he really sympathized with the cause and he wanted to, he thought it'd be good to link his, he only had one Romanian athlete. So he thought it'd be good to link me with him. Uh, his athlete's much younger. So thought it'd be a good match where we kind of work both ways. He's more experienced than me as a slider, but I was a little older, more experienced as an athlete. So we kind of formed our own team. And honestly, for like those three weeks, he was like uh, my Romanian brother and Marius was our Romanian I wouldn't say dad, but maybe like a weird uncle. And, uh, but it was awesome because he got so, I was telling him about what I was telling you guys about Koenigsegg and the history there. And he's just like, give me, I need one of those yarmulkes. Like, I'm, I'm so pumped up. You got to show these people like that you're here and we're going to show them that Israel means business. And yeah, it was just great having that uh, support and motivation coming from him. That's a really unique experience to have that relationship. Our most sliders, I guess they call them sliders. Are most of the other athletes accepting of you representing Israel? Is there some kind of community? Like, are you in touch with these people throughout the year? Um, yeah. So, yeah, you meet tons of athletes when you're out on tour. Uh, this was my first season internationally. So I really got to meet everyone. And I think I was the only male athlete to compete on all four circuits. So I really met pretty much everyone. And lots of support. Um, my U.S. my former U.S. athletes, very understanding, and you know, they, they understand my motivations, and so they're very supportive, most of them. And then, uh, yeah, obviously you have your tensions with some other athletes, not tensions in like because I'm for Israel, but it's because we're all vying for those uh, final Olympic spots. So uh, there's a lot of tension there, but um, yeah, overall from everybody involved in sliding, people working at the tracks, the people manage the tracks, the uh, a lot of the coaches just from the other teams, everybody very helpful, very uh, accepting and really couldn't do it without that kind of secondary support network. Do you um, get to connect with the Jewish communities in these places like, like Placid, Whistler, Park City, Germany? Yeah, so um, Germany is a little difficult uh, in the area I was in Koenigsee. There's not much there left, which is why we, like I mentioned, we light the, the, the menorah on Hanukkah to just remind people that we're still there. Um, when I went to Munich, I was wearing my jacket that day and a couple uh, Israelis who were living in Germany did come up to me. So that was, that was nice to connect with them and hear more about their experience living there. Um, in Lake Placid and in Park City, especially, there's a community that we, uh, they'll come and watch our races and, uh, We'll go to some of their events. Uh, I didn't spend enough time in Whistler because I literally, I was there for a week before COVID hit. So um, I was hoping to go to Vancouver and, and, and get together with uh, the Kabat there, but ran out of time. And, and Lake Placid, same thing. There's a synagogue there. It's not a huge community, but we, uh, we try to do some outreach there as well. You know, we had a session earlier in the year with Letitia Beck. She's an Israeli professional golfer. And she mentioned that while she's on tour uh, in the States, instead of staying at hotels with the other athletes, she actually connects with Jewish host families that put her up everywhere she goes. So maybe you can get some support there. I'm sure the 
community. Yeah, definitely, definitely in Park City and, and Whistler, very expensive places. That would be very helpful too. So it's something I'm going to look into. I want to um, take a moment to give a couple shout outs. You have some team members and some members of the Federation that are here on the call with us. Uh, Larry Sidney, who is a former skeleton athlete and Larry is the secretary general. Uh, of, uh, and uh, Dave Nichols is with us. We had a session with Dave earlier. He is the bobsled pilot. Uh, and I think we have one more member of your team. Michael Geithner is here. He is a bobsledder as well. I guess he's the guy that, that pushes the sled. Yes. <laughs> so thanks for your support, guys. Thanks for joining us. Do you have any questions that you want to share with Jared or do you want to embarrass him? Uh, I just like to watch him crash. <laughs> it, it's that's it, it, why that's why we why we ride in in the bobsled instead of outside the bobsled. Yeah, you know, I'll just I'll just say on Jared's behalf and really all of our athletes, uh, the the men and women in the program, they just uh, you know you don't get days off, you don't get days off in the sport. You know, people say, oh, it's it's summer, so you must not be training, right? And there's just, there's all that much more to do in the summer to get ready for the winter. So uh, Jared and all of our athletes are going hard and uh, just trying to, trying to reach their goals, you know, and representing Israel in the best way they can. And so um, we're, we're excited for what the season brings for, for Jared and for everyone. That's awesome. Thanks, Larry. Thanks, Dave. Good to see you again. Uh, Jared, any plans for uh, Yom Kippur or for uh, Sukkot? How, how do you uh, observe in South Florida? Yeah, we're still uh, trying to figure out the shul situation, whether we're going to be able to actually attend in person, socially distance. Of course, there's a shift situation going on with sanitation, uh, sanitation uh, in between the shifts. Um, other than that, I'll, I'll probably just be mostly, you know, atoning at home. And Sukkot, will, um, a lot of our neighbors build their own. It's a very Jewish community here, and uh, my neighbor is called Harbor Islands. Um, there's a shul for just the community and lots of Sukkot hopping to do. So uh, that's I'll be I'll be here, um, and then I'll probably stay a couple more weeks after that before, as I mentioned, likely heading out to Austria to start training in the beginning of November. Um, Eric would like to know. Um, how growing up in the South, did you prepare, how did you prepare for the cold? Oh. Uh, Step into the freezer, maybe? Just go right into it. Um, ice bats, probably, after track workouts were, like, the, the best thing. Um, New Orleans is, uh, you know, quietly kind of cold. It's very humid there. So even when it would get in the 50s, um, it's hard to describe how cold it felt, especially we didn't have an indoor track, so everything was outside. So that kind of got me prepared a little bit for uh, – or close enough to the sub-zero degree temperatures of Lake Placid. And tell us a little bit more about your track career. What what events did you specialize in? Any significant accomplishments to brag about? Sure. So, um, 100 meter specialist, forced to run the 200, forced to run the 4x4 four four against my will, but had to do it for the team. Uh, I won the 100 meter district title in a uh, district down here in Broward County, which not so easy. Um, and then I went on to run a two lane. I think I have like the ninth fastest hundred meter time. There it was a 1072 my freshman year. Uh, and then, uh, probably started going to a few too many parties after that, but, uh, no, we just got, we got a new coach and I think I worked better at the first one system. So, uh, yeah, 1072 is my best time. And then, uh, yeah, like I mentioned, not good enough to go to the Olympics for Israel in the hundred, but, made the switch to skeleton. What advice would you have for some aspiring skeleton athletes? Um, you just, <laughs> you got to do it. You got to get the runs in. Uh, the best advice I got was uh, to make sure I knew what I was doing exactly and get the, get, build the network and make sure I knew what I was getting into and uh, the network in terms of like the support and the, the coaching, the training, and just uh, first of all, I would say to do it. Definitely. We need more skeleton athletes next generation, but besides that, just make sure 
you get in touch with me or AJ or any of the other great athletes in our program, we're all helping each other and we'll definitely coach you through it. That's awesome. And Ori, uh, has, thank you again, has been posting a whole bunch of helpful links in here to oh, yeah. art articles and interviews he's conducted uh, and a little bit more about a skeleton driving school for those people who want to learn. Uh, I don't know, Ori, maybe you want to be uh, Jared's new coach, you can travel to exotic locations now. Yeah, that into I, it. A travel agent. Um, yeah, Ori makes a good point. If you go to, to Park City, they have uh, G-Force school, it's called. So that's where that's the best place to learn. And then if you like the sport, um, if you're American, just get in touch with us and we'll, uh, we'll guide you from there. But that, definitely, that's a good place to start learning. Jane, I would not be a, a strong coach for, uh, for, for Jared. That's why I'm sitting here on the couch and, and playing master soccer instead of, uh, you know, racing, racing in, uh, you know, in Beijing. Oh, well, at least Jared knows he can count on your support. And you have all of our support, Jared. We're proud of you. Thank you. And we, we wish you a lot of luck. Um, while I still have everybody's attention, I uh, just want to let you know that uh, Jared posted a link uh, you can do it again of where you can support him and where you can get your Jewish Jet swag. I also want to mention that Maccabi USA is a 501c3. Uh, we really appreciate the generosity of others. Uh, and so if you are so inclined, if you're enjoying our Maccabi USA at home sessions, you can make a charitable gift. I'll post the link in here. Uh, we have a couple really exciting events coming up. Uh, tomorrow night, uh, we have the President's Forum. Uh, with uh, our team rabbi, Rabbi Darren Levine. And then uh, we have a South Florida crowd here. So I assume that we have some Miami Marlins fans in the house. Uh, we have Ari Ackerman. Ari's with us on the call. He's been a loyal participant in our Maccabi USA at Home session. So uh, next Tuesday at eight, uh, we'll celebrate the Marlins uh, entering the MLB playoffs and have a great session with Donna and Arnie and our sports show with Ari. So um, any final questions for Jared before I let you all go into the night? I know everybody's itching to see the, the heat tip off at 830, <laughs> cheering on the Marlins against the Braves right now. Thanks for your attention. It's been a really lot of fun, and it's been fun getting to know you, Jared, and David. Thanks, Shane.